So we've seen that at any point in time, in any market, you, or almost any market, you have um, buyers and sellers who want to trade, but are not able to trade uh, immediately. So we've seen that on the labor market, you have workers who want to sell their labor, get a job. You have firms who want to buy labor, you know, fill vacant uh, positions. Um, and yet it takes time, these two, these two uh, groups coexist. It takes time for unemployed workers to find a job. It takes time for firms to fill vacancies. Um, also both uh, coexist. On the housing market, you have houses that sit empty for a while. At the same time, you have um, families who are looking for a house, are searching for a house, and it takes, takes them time to find the right house for them. Uh, these two uh, vacant houses and families looking for a home also always coexist. It's true on the car market that we discussed, you have cars that sit in the inventory at dealers. And at the same time, you have people who are looking to buy the cars that they want. And, uh, you know, it takes, them, it takes time for them to find the car. And similarly, it takes time for the cars in inventory to be sold. These two always coexist. We've seen that that's true as well on the service market. You know, you may have a nanny who wants to work as a nanny and is trying to find a family. Uh, and at the same time, you have families who are always looking to hire nannies and it takes time uh, for them to find the right nanny. Uh, we've seen, you know, that it could even be true for good. You may be looking for a specific good and then that good is sold out. So you have to wait to be able to get it. At the same time, you have companies that are selling similar goods and they, you know, and they are not able uh, to sell them uh, and it's going to take time for them uh, to sell them. So. Uh, the bottom line is that at any point in time, in almost any markets, um, you have buyers and sellers. Uh, buyers who want to uh, buy stuff, sellers who want to sell stuff. Um, and these two uh, coexist and it takes time for them uh, to meet each other for the transaction to happen. So how can we model that? Because of course, if we think about the Valrasian market, you can't explain that. In the Valrasian market, you can always buy whatever you want at the market price, any quantity of it, and you can always sell any quantity of uh, the good at the market price. So that really can't capture this idea, um, that this phenomenon that I've been describing. Um, the same is true in monopolistic market where um, the seller takes the demand as given and then they can just, you know, and then they pick a price and once they've picked the price, they can sell the quant you know, a quantity for certain uh, that's given by the demand. So to be able to model this, we'll have to introduce a tool uh, that's called the matching function. Uh, and a market in which trades are uh, modeled by a matching function is called a matching market. So this is what we'll, uh, what we'll use to be able to describe the coexistence of vacant job and an employed worker and on the product market, the coexistence of idle labor and capital and uh, unfulfilled uh, consumption. So uh, what, what exactly is uh, the mat matching function? What does it represent? So um, your matching function the way you can think about it is that it's an aggregate function that's going to capture to summarize uh, all the complexity uh, the complexities of trading that happen at the micro level and it's going to summarize them at a macro level. So it's an aggregate function. Uh, so it's very similar to say a production function. So a production function is summarizing at the aggregate level all the production that happens at the micro level. Um, and you know the production uh, process is very complex, and the aggregate, uh, the production function just summarizes that. Similarly, the matching function is summarizing a very complex trading uh, process uh, that happens at the micro level and is summarizing at uh, the macro level. And uh, it's going to be a well-behaved function. 
it's going to be fairly simple. And it's going to depend only on a few variables, on a few aggregate variables. So it's really something that simplifies the complexity of the real world and uh, at the aggregate level. So what are the type of complex trading process that the matching function summarizes? You know, wh why is it that we need uh, such matching function? Well, in fact, you know, most trading, it's quite complicated because um, this, you know, the world is very complex, very heterogeneous, um, and therefore it's actually hard for, uh, you know, buyers and sellers to get together so that um, a trade happens that uh, both sides uh, want it. So for instance, on the labor market, if you're a worker, you know, you have specific uh, skills that you bring to the table, you're looking for a job in a specific location, you're looking for a job in a specific industries, you know, you, you're looking for uh, colleagues that you can um, get along with, you may be looking for a specific you know, uh, working conditions. Um, so, you know, what you have in mind is not just, you know, at the aggregate level, it looks like a vacant job, but at the micro level, you are, what you have in mind is a very specific uh, job. Similarly, on the firm side, at the aggregate level, it looks, you know, what they're offering looks like just a vacant job, but in fact, you know, and they are looking for just a worker, but in fact, their needs are very specific. They are looking for a worker with the right skill set with the right experience that will fit in the culture of the firm. Um, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's quite, um, it's, you know, and they're looking for a worker that can work in a specific location, starting at a specific uh, point in time. So it's actually a very specific need. And for the, you know, the right worker and the right job to take to, to come together is actually going to take uh, quite a bit of time. The, the firm will have to interview many workers, look at many, look at many resumes, um, to make sure they find the right person on the worker side, you have to, you know, look at a lot of uh, vacancies. You have to, you know, contact uh, your networks. You have to, you know, read help-wanted ads in newspapers or online on job portals. So it takes a lot of time to find that right match um, because you know everybody is different. All workers are different. All jobs are different. So it takes time to uh, find each other and. So of course we can't capture all of that in a macro model, and so the matching function is going to summarize all of this. Um, and this complexity that I described that happens on the labor market, it, it happens on any market. So if we go back to the housing market, you know every house is very specific, it's in a specific location, it has you know, a certain number of room, a garden or not, specific amenities, uh, specific size. Uh, you know it's like old or new, different architectural styles, it's in a good school district or not. You know, so this is very specific and what people are looking for similarly is also very specific. Um, and so it's going to take time for the family and the house to find each other. Um, but the same is true even in very simple things in life, like say you want a coffee. Well, you know, all, all, you know, all coffees are different. Uh, you may have different tasting coffee, different coffee shops are maybe further or closer to where you are. Um, the style of coffee they make may be different. Um, you know, coffee shops are open at different points in time. They're open on different days. Um, and so, you know, and so, so even something simple like that, it may take a bit of time for somebody who wants coffee to find uh, <laughs> the coffee. And similarly, coffee shops don't always, uh, you know, don't, al don't always receive customers that uh, continuously. Uh, it also, you know, you may sit, if you're a barista, you may be idle for a while until you have a customer um, who shows up and uh, buys a cup of coffee. Um, so there is just also just randomness in life in when people want their coffee and who are the people around who want to buy coffee. So you can have idle baristas and at the same time you have people who are looking for coffee somewhere else. And so uh, even in a simple example like that, at any point in time, it's not so easy for the, uh, the trade to occur. Um, so that's what the matching function is going to capture. It's going to summarize um, 
complex uh, trade process. that occurs on uh, most markets. So the only markets that will be exceptions are markets in which the goods that are traded are very homogeneous, and we know they are all the same. And therefore, you know, you don't really have this complexity of the buyer finding the right seller. If we think about the stock market, that's an example where you know, all the shares are exactly the same. Um, and, you know, and therefore, um, it's well modeled by a, Valrasian, uh, by a Valrasian model. And in fact, Valras was uh, inspired when he built this model of the Valrasian competitive, competitive market by the stock market. But the stock market is an exception. Very few markets are like the stock market. In, in practice, all the, goods, uh, all the goods are different and all the sellers have different uh, specific needs. One thing I should add is that the complexity of the trade process uh, is quite visible by the effort that both buyers and sellers put into uh, trying to trade. Um, so if you think about the labor market, So if you think about the labor market, what type of effort are we talking about? Well, well firms that are trying to fill a vacant job, uh, they have to spend a lot of time recruiting. And a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money on recruiting. That's because it's hard for them to find workers. Workers, of course, we know. They also spend a lot of time and effort trying to find a uh, trying to find a job. And so you might ask, but on the product market, surely um, you do not have things like that. But in fact, you, you do very much so. Um, so if you're a buyer on the product market, you also spend a lot of time doing some uh, market research trying to, let's say you want to go re to a restaurant, you spend time on Yelp trying to figure out which one, which restaurant is the restaurant you like, or if you want to buy some goods, you might uh, look at consumer magazines or wire cutter or anything like that to try to figure out which good is the one you like with the right qualities and the right properties. Um, so it, it's, exa it's exactly the same, or you may, you know, uh, let's say you move to a new town and you're looking for a good coffee place. You might try a couple of coffee places until you settle on the one you like where you will go regularly and become a customer. Um, so consumers, similarly, they also uh, do a lot of market research. And that's why, that's why Yelp exists. That's why all the other, uh, all these other internet services where you can leave reviews uh, you know, uh, exist. That's because it's not so easy to find the place you like. If, if it was so easy, there would be no uh, place, in a sense, for Yelp or, uh, or Google uh, to exist. Or the wire cutter. Oh, it's true if you want to go on a trip, you know, you're going to do your research on TripAdvisor. Um, and similarly, for uh, sellers, they also the same way that workers spend a lot of time uh, searching for job and you know posting their CVs online on LinkedIn. Uh, and other places, uh, firms uh, who have things to sell are going to do marketing, they are going to do advertising to try to um, find co uh, consumers. So the existence of uh, of marketing and advertising tells us that uh, it is complex to find consumers. So that's another manifestation of this 
trading, uh, of the complexity of the trading process that will model with a, uh, with a matching function. And one thing that we'll see that's a big advantage, kind of a side advantage of using a, a matching function and representing the market as a matching market is that um, trade will always occur in a bilateral monopoly situation. That is, once the seller and the buyer have found each other, they are happy to have found each other. So there is a surplus that's created from this match, from the fact that they've come together. And so because there is a surplus, it means that both the seller and the buyer they have something to win to actually uh, proceed with the match. That's why there is a bilateral monopoly situation. If you want, there is a pie that has been created by the match. And, uh, and you know, you need to decide how to split the pie between the buyer and the seller. But if the match is dissolved, the pie is lost. So both sides are going to lose. Uh, so we're in a bilateral monopoly situation. Both sides have some, some, you know, some bargaining power, if you want. Um, and so, in a situation like this, we know that there are actually many, many ways to split the pies. In fact, there are infinitely many ways to split the pie. Um, and so what that means for us is that there'll be infinitely many ways to set a price once we're in a bilateral monopoly situation like this. Uh, and um, so there'll be many ways to, to set a price. And in fact, we'll have to make an assumption about the price norm that's used to set prices in the market. What that means is that it'll give us a lot of, uh, you know, it's very different than using a Valrasian market where the price has to equalize supply and demand uh, and be clearing. Here, we'll have to make an assumption uh, about the price norm. And this assumption will be motivated by empirical evidence. And then based on that price norm, then, you know, the, you know, the supply and demand are going to be equalized uh, actually through tightness, so in, an, in another way. Uh, but that will allow us to be much more realistic. Uh, the pricing mechanism that we'll assume will be able to use much more realistic pricing mechanism based on, uh, on evidence, motivated by evidence. So what we'll be able to do is look at the real world, look how prices are set in the product market, labor market, then assume a price norm that mimics uh, that and then see what are the micro implications of that price norm. 